What are some great real world ways we can add and improve upon our VFR flight planning process? Hey everyone, Jason Schappert here of M0A.com and you are listening to the Private Pilot Podcast brought to you by our brand new, well, it's brand new, it's not out yet, but it's about to be out, new online ground school, shifting everything over. You'll be able to check it all out on m0a.com here very, very soon. Coming out uh, very uh, beginning of December, unless you have already RSVP'd, you'll get in there earlier. So just excited to have you all on board with that. It's gonna be incredible. Full learning management system, uh, just too many features to list. I'm not here to sell you on stuff. I'm here to deliver value to you all. So let's dive into it. Let's start uh, delivering that value. For those of you watching this on YouTube and Facebook, thank you. Please do subscribe to us on YouTube, like us uh, on Facebook as well. Those of you listening to this uh, through whatever podcasting app or service you use, thank you for making this one of the top rated aviation podcasts out there. The topic I want to chat about with you today here is VFR flight planning. And if you will just leave me a comment, obviously if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, that is way easier uh, than doing it on your Apple podcast app. But if you're listening to us as a podcast, you can go back and catch the videos as well, see what everybody commented. What are some of the struggles you have with VFR flight plan or had with VFR flight plan? I know for many of you, it's the cross country nav logs, right? It, it is extensive to fill out this nav log. I mean, number by number. And in the online ground school I have, it's gotta be like an hour long video, maybe more, where I fill out the nav log, go number by number with you. And I'm talking to the detail that a lot of instructors don't even wanna to get to, but is so necessary. Things like top of climb, top of descent. Like a lot of people just ignore that and just go from here to here to my first checkpoint. But that's not realistic, because there's climb, there's descent, there's cruise, and those are three different ground speeds. Because I'm traveling through winds that need to be interpolated, and people freak out when you use the word interpolation, because they go, wow, how do I use the surface METAR, and then use the winds aloft and interpolate through this? And my ground school members know we've been talking about this on our recent webinars and everything else to help you brush up on these topics. And while the scope of this podcast today is not to get into the nitty gritty details of how to do a nav log. If you're looking for the nitty gritty details on how to do a nav log, I'm gonna send you uh, to the online ground school. And honestly, you don't even need to pay us. You can just take a free trial if you wanna check it out, m0atrial.com. You can see the nav log video. That'll be worth it alone uh, to you just to get in there and really check all of that out would be of such a benefit to you. The scope I wanna get in today is the real world aspect of this, the real world applicability of how I, still to this day, 10,000 hours later, how I plan my flights. And that's what I wanna share with you all today. And for some of you, this will be a bit of a review because we just recently talked about this, so I'll breeze through this rel relatively quickly, but spend enough time for those of you who maybe this is your first podcast with us, I use something called the three hour rule. What do I mean when I say the three hour rule? I don't want to be in that airplane from start to shutdown greater than three hours. Allow me to explain. From the moment I start that airplane, clear, you know, ignition both, start the airplane. From the moment I start that airplane, I start a timer. From the, that entire time, right? So it's start, it's taxi, it's run up, it's takeoff, it's climb out, it's cruise, all the way to descent, taxi again, pulling up to the line guy, hopefully giving me the big X, it's time to stop and shut down. And when I pull the mixture to shut that airplane down, that timer better not say anything greater than 259.59. It should not say three hours. That's the three hour rule. Meaning, I know 23 Mike Zulu, as an example, holds four and a half hours of fuel. But I don't wanna test that theory. 
I, I'm not in the business of being a test pilot by any means, right? So I don't desire to test such a theory. You see, when I operate on the three hour rule, and I realize when I start the timer from start to shut down, some people will just do it from takeoff to landing. But I like to do it from start to shut down because I know I have 10 minutes of taxi on either side with a little bit of a run up and everything else. And it's just like 20, 30 extra minutes I give myself. So realistically, I'm flight planning roughly two and a half hour legs. And let's be honest with ourselves. Can your bladder go much more than two and a half, three hours? Um, anyways, you're probably thirsty, you're hungry, you're a little grumpy, you wanna stretch your legs, you hit the restroom, you wanna get out of that airplane, get up and around walking anyways. It's just good for you, right? Flying is, is so mental. Uh, it's not like in the airliner, I can at least get up and walk up and down the aisles and use the restroom. It's just, I don't have that option in a Cessna 172. I'm stuck in the plane. There is no reason for me to test the four and a half hours of fuel. There, the, the 172 claims it holds, and that's in a perfect world with a perfect fuel burn, which came, this airplane was made in 1972. It's had four or five engines since then. The book is accurate, but to what, to what degree now, right? So I plan the three hour rule. And the three hour rule has saved me on many occasions. I will never forget. And I actually share the story. I'm working on a, a new book. Some of you know that. Um, I share the story in the book how I was on something called the Good Pilot Tour, which, gosh, we had to do 20 different seminars across probably about 20 days. It was a different city every day. Uh, sharing back then, it was my JFK Junior Seminar. That was, that's an old seminar now, but back in the day, this is when it was brand new that I was sharing some of this data from the JFK Junior accident. And I was flying the 172. At the time, it was still 7159 Quebec. Now it's 23 Mike Zulu, repainted, changed tail number flying all around. We had just done a seminar in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was to be in Louisville, Kentucky the next day. And I remember the weather was just terrible, absolutely terrible. And flying down, utilizing the three hour rule, which that was a shorter leg anyways, we got to about Cincinnati, Ohio and realized the weather was terrible. There was no chance we were gonna be making it uh, to, to Louisville where we were actually heading to. So we diverted. And whatever airport we diverted to, that didn't work out. Shot and approach, went and missed. Went to the next airport. We diverted a total of eight times. I can't remember all the airports we attempted. I had to go back and look at my logbook. I know the number though. We diverted eight different times. Now, about the third or fourth diversion, and not every time was an approach. Some were just like, hey, that's, there's no chance. I'm listening to the, to the ATIS. There's no chance. Don't even bother attempting it. That's way below minimums. We're not even going to bother going. Um, about the third or fourth attempt, the, the controller for Cincinnati Approach comes on and says, hey, 7159 Quebec, uh, safe fuel status. Like they were concerned about us. And when I explained to them, they said, we, we've got about you know, two and a half hours of fuel you could hear the relief in the controller's voice by going, wow, he's got everybody else declaring minimum fuel and they're, they're in dire situations. And he's looking at us going, wow, three or four diversions, this plane's gotta be next. And it wasn't the case because we had planned for such. You see, when I operate by the three hour rule, yes, I could probably make it from here to Atlanta, like you're seeing in this video series. A hundred percent, I am positive without a shadow of a doubt, 23 Mike Zulu could have made it from Ocala into Peachtree, absolutely no problems, no questions asked, and, and stayed within the rules and regulations for VFR and IFR flight for that matter. Absolutely positive I could have done that, but I chose to stop. And if you haven't seen the video uh, just yet, I encourage you to go see it on YouTube and Facebook as we enter into this flight planning month, I stopped in Macon, Georgia. And again, totally could have made it in the peach tree. But I stopped in Macon because I knew, first off, the weather was uh, less than ideal uh, for the flight. Atlanta is an absolute zoo getting in there. What are the odds of a little 172 getting priority around the nation's definitely one of the top 10 busiest airports around Hartsfield, I'm sure of it. I just didn't want to take that chance. What if I get an arrival? What if I'm asked to go miss? What if I have to divert? What if there is a plane that had to gear up on the runway and I'm not making it into that airport anymore? 
so I chose to stop in Macon. When I could have made it to Peachtree Direct, I totally get it. I chose to stop in Macon. I stretched my legs. I got a snack from the snack machine. I drank some more water. And most importantly, I grabbed fuel. And I grabbed fuel and I came into Peachtree with, it was only like an hour flight from, from that point, and made it on in feeling good and knowing that I had options. That's what was most important to me is keeping my options open. I see this every single year at the big air shows, at the Sun and Funds, at the Oshkoshes of the world. Somebody flies to Oshkosh, they have just enough fuel to be legal, we'll say VFR or IFR, to make it to Oshkosh, they check all the regulations. However, they get there and they forget they forget that they're going to be asked to hold, that uh, there was a hot air balloon launch, that there was a uh, gear up or some sort of incident on the runway, and there is every single year somebody has an off airport excursion or a gear up or something silly, um, usually not no one getting hurt other than bent aluminum and bent up airplanes, um, and it happens every year. And that what also happens is I'm in, you know, fly in the circle around Rush Lake or Green Lake or whatever it is in my, in my hole and you hear somebody calling up, hey, Cessna this, Piper this, you know, experimental this, uh, minimum fuel. And they say, all aircraft, you know, take, make a left turn around the lake again, my minimum fuel aircraft, come on up and they get this priority um, for their mistake in a way. Let me share with you something else interesting. And again, I say all that to say that Stop in Chicago on your way to Oshkosh if you're coming from the south and, and then head in with a ton of fuel so you have more options. Stop in Ocala when you're heading down to Sun and Fun uh, in Lakeland, Florida. You want to arrive with options because you're going to be asked to hold. I saw this not too long ago. By the time you're listening to this, it's almost been a month now since this happened. There was an airplane in, I think it was a 172 of some sort, in Knoxville, Tennessee, ran out of fuel, landed on the highway there in Knoxville, right? Um, successful landing, no damage to the plane, no, no damage to cars, land on the road, obviously shut down the road. They somehow, someone brought him fuel I don't know if a fuel truck came out, I don't know the whole story, or someone brought, you know, five gallon gas cans of 100 low lead out to them, fueled him up, or her up, I, I don't know who, if it was a male or female pilot, but filled the pilot up, filled the plane up. Highway patrol then shut down enough highway so the pilot could take off again. Now hear me out on this, okay? Maybe this is me just being weird and just being Jason perhaps, but... Does anybody else think that that was kind of like a reward in a way? Like, like, show of hands, I can't see you right now, but let me know in the chat, like, do you think, hey, I, I would like to take off on a road, like, that would have been really cool. Like, who else? Let me know in the chat. Who else would have thought it'd be really, really cool to have Highway Patrol shut down the, shut down the road so you can legally take off again? I, I, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so do you feel some negative reinforcement perhaps? Like this pilot exercised poor decision making. And again, there's, there's no reports out or anything like that. So maybe I'm jumping to conclusions. Maybe they had another fuel issue. Like, uh, I'm pretty sure it was starvation though. But let's say they exercised poor decision making, led to fuel starvation, landed on a road, jeopardized the lives of other individuals, Right? And when I say other individuals, it's not just the, the people in the cars. It's the passengers they had with them in the plane. It's what if they clipped a power line and now you, we have linemen, meaning power linemen, um, out working on live electricity. There's just like so many things that I think about with this because of their poor decision making. And then they kind of got rewarded because I personally, maybe I'm strange, I think it'd be pretty cool to be able to legally take off on a road. I hear that happens in Alaska. I don't know how true that is. I've never been to Alaska, but I hear that's true. Um, 
I just feel like they were kind of rewarded in some weird, twisted way. Let me know in the chat. Maybe, maybe I'm being the strange one here, but um, I think it'd be pretty cool. That, that's right up there with, you know, flying on an airliner and they call out, are any pilots on board? Like, I know that's not just my one sick fantasy to take over and save the day and land the, land the 737 or the, the 747 or whatever it is, A320 that you're flying on. Like, I know I'm not the only one who's had that, uh, had that, that fantasy before. I think of all these things, I think back to the three hour rule. The three hour rule just simply keeps you out of trouble. At the end of the day, I don't wanna be in trouble, especially with the FAA, especially with highway patrol and everything else. So I would encourage you to adopt something like the three hour rule. When I say something like the three hour rule, what, what I mean by that is your airplane may be different. A very good friend of mine uh, flies a Bonanza that can be six hours of fuel when it's filled to the top. So he'll operate more on like the four and a half hour rule when it's full. And when it's just to the tabs, it's the three hour rule because he holds about four and a half hours of fuel then. Basically, from start to shutdown, I want to be taxiing up to the line guy with about an hour and a half of fuel. So you need to customize the three hour rule, the 315 rule, the 245 rule, whatever you call it. I want you shutting down at the FBO with an hour and a half of fuel at, at cruise flight. That's where I'd like you to be because that gives you options. Uh, same friend with the Bonanza um, is in the process of actually installing tip tanks. Um, on the Bonanza, and this is, a, this is a popular STC for the Bonanza, and they only hold like seven gallons a side, uh, but, they're, but they're tip tanks, and his entire intention, yes, they, they increase the wing area and actually do help with some performance, oddly enough, even though they add some weight, his entire purpose of the tip tanks is to put seven gallons in each tip tank and forget about it. Through all his calculations, pretend it is not even there. Now, obviously, I know the, the maintenance side of that fuel goes bad and he's going to need to burn it, you know, uh, once a month or, um, you know, once every other month, something like that. You don't want fuel just sitting there that long. You want to actually burn it and use it and make sure that pump and device is working. But add seven aside, so 14 gallons, which in a Bonanza, 14 gallons is about... Uh, 45 minutes of fuel, uh, give or take a little bit, depending on your settings there. But have that, we'll call it 45 minutes of fuel, and totally forget about it. Don't even add it to the shutdown with an hour and a half of fuel. Because there could come a day where you'll be so thankful that you have it, that you burn through even that extra hour and a half because you're on diversion number eight. And you know, wow, thank God I've been doing all these calculations without this extra 45 minutes of fuel, but I, I have it. You, you, so you can't operate knowing you always have this pillow, knowing you always have this blankie. Operate like you don't have it, and in the jam, you use it. So when you have that kind of mindset, so I, I, I love that. Not all of us have the, the luxury of having something like tip tanks, but that is a great purpose and a great use of tip tanks. Now there's weight limitations and everything else to that. I get it. If you want, you could put, you know, three and a half and three and a half in there. So it's seven. Okay. It's only extra 20 minutes, but again, you act like it's not there. You're so blessed and thankful that you have it. Again, I'm, I'm rambling now. The three hour rule. Is it the 245? Is it the 315? Is it the four and a half? What, what is the rule for you and how are you going to work to stick to it? You see, this means more fuel stops. And I'm sorry, and it means you're going to get to your to cross countries 30 minutes later than you normally would because of the descent and the other takeoff and the time in the FBO and everything else, but you are going to arrive at your destination with options. Heck, you're going to arrive at your fuel stop with options because if you're landing at your fuel stop with two and a half hours um, burnt, you have so many options, even with your first intended fuel stop. You're in aviation, the only time you have too much fuel is when you're on fire. It is the honest truth. So I need you to arrive and think about things that way as you go through them. M Zero Nation, thank you. Thank you so much for being such a blessing to myself and this amazing team here 
at m0a.com. Thank you for your comments on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you for your reviews uh, in the App Store and wherever you listen to this, um, on Stitcher or on iTunes or in the podcast app, however you listen to this. Thank you so much for, I mean it, by making this one of, literally, one of the most popular aviation podcasts out there. It is just such a blessing to have an opportunity to give back to you all. Hey, uh, I hope you'll check out this entire flight plan series. I hope um, if you're looking for more great content, did you know every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, I do a live stream on the M0A Facebook page. It's a show called In Flight Coffee. I make a cup of coffee, we sit down, we have a little topic discussion, sometimes it's weather, sometimes I show you what's in my flight bag, Some one time I showed you what's in my survival kit, just different little 20, 30 minute little topics while sipping a cup of coffee, and then we answer all your questions. It's, it's a small group, it's just a few hundred of us live, but it's just such a great opportunity to interact, live out the mantra that a good pilot is, is always learning and pursuing mastery in everything you do. Because at the end of the day, what we're all about is pursuing mastery. And mastery is a never ending journey. So thank you for partaking on that with us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you.